Hey, what's up guys? Uh, we're just uh, sitting here discussing a case that just recently came into the HQ. Uh, and I thought that it uh, brought up a lot of points that, that are worth reviewing um, with everyone. So the case that came in, <clears throat> well, first off, the symptoms itself, even without putting my hands on this person or asking any follow-up questions, the, the symptoms were pain in and around the PSIS region, um, as well as pain in the ipsilateral groin and pain traveling down the, the ipsilateral leg, uh, but no further than the knee. So the person pretty much, you know, it hurts right that back here. I have pain coming this way into the groin, and then I have a hamstring pain. Now, the part that gets frustrating about this is that this client, of course, has been to a variety of different people. She's been to medical doctors, she's been to therapists and chiropractors, and, and getting the list of diagnoses um, was, was remarkable. So just when I say that, what most people should point to know already, or at least we've said this in, in various videos, is that's the pain description for an SI joint lesion. So you have a dorsal sacral ligament problem, dorsal sacral lig ligament refers into the ipsilateral uh, groin region, as well as down the leg, uh, not further than the knee, unless you also have simultaneous problems in gluteus minimus, which is often the case with SI problems, in which case the gluteus minimus can also refer pain past the knee, but to the lateral side of the ankle. So this is a standard um, symptom uh, description for that problem. Now, the number of problems that she's been told that she had were remarkable. For example, one person told her that her pelvis was shifted out of alignment. I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, we've talked about this a million times. What does it mean for a pelvis to be shifted out of alignment? Why are we even talking about a static term of malalignment in today, this day and age of research? Uh, there's just so many things wrong with that. It might as well not get into it. Another person blamed a disc, which, which gets weird because if you're blaming a disc, there, there was no radiculopathy. Um, there was nothing to, to demonstrate that increased uh, thoracic pressure caused more pain. There was no numbing and tingling. It didn't go into the feet. Um, so the, the disc thing really didn't make much sense. Another person told her that her leg length uh, was off minimally. Uh, we've been over this again. Uh, this idea that the body needs to be balanced. I don't know who started this idea um, and I don't know why it gets perpetuated. Like from my understanding of the human body, if you look on the inside, I'm pretty sure that client only had one liver. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you only get one and it's always on the same side. So if you look inside the body, what you realize is the human body is not balanced. So I don't understand why people are, are incessantly trying to balance um, this, this, uh, the body. Making the long story short, the reason why Dr. Shivers and I wanted to bring this up is because another thing that we noticed is that she was working with an FR and an FRC practitioner. Um, and then we get to the idea of this is not a technique, it's not something you try. She's tried acupuncture, she's tried ART, she's tried you know, manipulation, she's tried all these things and none of them work. Um, and then you go to a FR, FRC practitioner and I ask what exercises are being prescribed? And again, they're being prescribed as if it's just another technique whereby you try these exercises, but within about two seconds of her assessment, I knew that these random exercises were not gonna help. So let me tell you the rest of her findings. This client has no hip, none. There, there's no internal rotation. There's very little external rotation. Any hip movement calls upon other areas of the body to, to help the movement with. So we're working with no hip. And the other thing that we noticed is that there was no lumbar spine. So we had little to no segmentation, little to no awareness as to what you're doing uh, when she's moving her lumbar spine. Then I asked, well, what types of exercises are being prescribed? Uh, are you doing 90-90s, for example? The answer is yes. So I say, show me your 90-90s. And all was being prescribed was 90-90 transfers from one side to another. So if you follow the logic here, what we're saying is the client doesn't have a hip, therefore we're gonna put them on the ground and have them display their terrible hip repeatedly. Aside from that, she was being assigned pelvis exercises like clams for some reason. So I guess we were trying to strengthen the hip that's non-existent. There was hamstring strength. Once again, uh, you're doing 
hip extension exercises to activate the hamstring, but you have no hip. So the problem becomes, if you have no hip, then what are these exercises supposed to do? You're, you're, you're trying to build capacity into a joint that doesn't even have the capacity to move like a joint. So the question becomes, is there any treatment, any treatment that you can think of that will permanently fix an SI joint when the SI joint is situated between a non-existent hip and a non-existent low back? So the case gets thrown here to myself, Dr. Chivers, someone else here, and they say, well, we tried everything, what do we do? And then we end up just prescribing the exact same basic things that we've been preaching all of these years. Correct. I think, I think what this really comes down to and what I, what I think I would like to add to this little discussion is not anything specific to the case. I think it's just specific to functional range systems. And it's something that I really try to drive home uh, at functional, functional range assessment. And that's the difference between what we call in the cognitive sciences or what, what I lecture on at, at FRA and that's facts and features. <clears throat> and so what we have to understand when we do an assessment on somebody is a couple of things. Number one, the assessment is for us to get information. It's for us to collect data, to uh, get as much quantifiable uh, data as possible so that we can use that data to make an analysis in terms of what are the hierarchy of needs, what are the priorities for this person. <clears throat> that is how we gather uh, information to decide what is a fact and what is a feature. And so when, we, when it comes to movement, features are things like strength, features are things like endurance, features are things like uh, doing a movement and grading it in terms of a movement pattern. Things that have facts in them are things that we know that have some objective truth that, that makes them fact. And so when it comes to movement and when it comes to an assessment of somebody who is doing a movement, we have to focus on the difference between what are facts and what are features. And so that brings us into what the rules of functional range systems are. And that is we look entirely at facts. And that's why we have two rules that we abide by from an assessment perspective. And that means that if I have a case, I need to look at, I need to keep the rules of FRS in mind, and I need to understand that those rules are based on fact. They're based on things that we can objectively look at. They're things that we can objectively quantify. They're not based on features of strength, or I think that this person needs more hip strength, or I think that this piece person needs more core strength, because those are entirely features. Now, we can build features into a system, but we can only build features into a system based on the facts of that system. So if we gather, if we say that our assessment is information gathering, we want the information to be gathered upon facts. And so when we apply the FRS system of assessment and we say, well, this, in this case, this young lady comes in with SI pain and we look at her hips and we say, well, you're, you're not abiding by the rules of FRS in your hips. And we look at the pelvis and we say, you're not abiding by the rules of FRS in your pelvis. And you're not abiding by the rules of FRS in your lumbar spine. <clears throat> and all of you guys are, are familiar with the rules, so I'm not necessarily gonna go into those right now, but if we can just make the, uh, the assessment into whether or not somebody is, is abiding by the rules, which we're going to say are the objectional or the objective truths of the assessment, it's only that that you can build your intervention on. And so if somebody is not abiding by the rules, regardless of what you think should be there or these, you know, what exercises you think this person needs to be doing to build whatever, whatever characteristic you want to, to build, you have to understand that at the very basic level, they are failing the rules of movement. So it is our job from either an, uh, an FR perspective, an FRC perspective, um, but really they're one and the same thing because we're working out the same template to uh, tailor our intervention and our application of functional range systems to the facts and trying to reestablish what we think, because this is information that we have given you, this is information that we've provided you in our, in our education, so that we can start to reestablish uh, fundamental joint motion in these, in these people. And if we bring it back down to establishing fundamental joint motion, 
Once you start to reestablish that, adding features onto a system becomes very, very easy.